on World News Tonight. Arden says done. The New Zealand leader Jacinta Arden announced her shock resignation before upcoming election. Russian backlash. Defence Minister Lavrov makes a shocking comparison of the West to the Nazi dictator Hitler. Crashing yen. The yen takes a tumble as the Bank of Japan keeps holding on to its policy of high interest rates. And blessing the pets. Fluffy friends gather with their owners to get blessed on St. Anthony's Day. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on the World News. Now we have a lot of stories from around the world to report to you tonight. From the latest on the Ukraine war and the ongoing details about the World Economic Forum. But we begin with breaking news that came over day from New Zealand. Prime Minister of New Zealand Jacinda Ardern calls it quits after becoming the world's youngest female Prime Minister after she was sworn into the highest office in New Zealand. Jacinda Ardern stated in a televised statement that she will not seek re-election and plans to step down no later than early February. She is quitting as New Zealand's Prime Minister ahead of this year's election. It was a shock moment when a visibly emotional Jacinda Ardern took to the stage on Thursday to announce her plans to step down as New Zealand's Prime Minister. Arden said she was not stepping down because the job was hard, but because she believed others could do better. A vote to elect the next Labour leader will be held on Sunday, with a general election scheduled for the 14th of October, a vote that Arden believes the Labour Party will win. And so today I'm announcing that I will not be seeking re-election and that my term as Prime Minister will conclude no later than the 7th of February. I know what this job takes and I know that I no longer have enough in the tank to do it justice. It's that simple. Arden's initial election made a big splash on the global stage because of her gender and youth, coining the phrase Jacinda mania that will help us to build a future New Zealand can be proud of. The charismatic 42-year-old won international praise and admiration for her responses to the mass shooting by a white supremacist in Christchurch, a fatal volcanic eruption, and her handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. One analyst said Arden's announcement was a huge surprise, as polls, though not quite the stratospheric height seen during the 2020 election, still ranked her as the country's preferred Prime Minister. They added there was no clear successor. Deputy Prime Minister Grant Robertson, who also serves as Finance Minister, said in a statement he would not seek to stand as the next Labour leader. Arden said she made a point of telling her daughter Neve, who she gave birth to during her time in office, that she was looking forward to being there when she started school this year, and told her longtime partner, Clark Gayford, that it was time that they were married. I had the support of my family to continue. This has been the most fulfilling five and a half years of my life, but it has also had its challenges. I am human. Politicians are human. We give all that we can for as long as we can, and then it's time. And for me, it's time. In Ukraine now, officials are investigating as to why a helicopter crashed in the suburb of Kyiv as the death toll has risen. Meanwhile, NATO has called for a significant boost in the supply of arms to Ukraine. The following visuals of this story is graphic. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. A Ukrainian helicopter crashed into a child care center in a Kiev suburb on Wednesday, killing at least 14 people, including the country's Minister of the Interior, who was aboard the aircraft. Interior Minister Denis Monastirsky was the most senior Ukrainian official to die since Russian forces invaded the country in February last year. A minute of silence, please. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky speaking via video link to an audience of world leaders and corporate executives gathered in Davos, Switzerland, requested a moment of silence for the victims. Ukrainian First Lady Olana Zelenska, who was in Davos, said she knew Monastirsky personally, and the loss was a personal blow. The early morning disaster stunned and terrified residents here. 
many who were dropping off children at the nursery when the helicopter crashed through the roof of the building. Mikola Antonov was inside with his five-year-old when suddenly everything was ablaze. Shock. I got up, started to put out the fire on my clothes that were burning, and searched for my son. He managed to get to the door. Nothing happened to him, thank God. And we started taking the children out. The teachers were great. They reacted quickly and we managed to take all children out into the yard. We came out and it was a shock, an apocalypse. All was on fire. Dozens of people were injured, including children, many suffering burns. Among them, Vanessa. Her mother looked down on the crash site from her 14th floor apartment at the spot where she'd just taken her child to nursery. The entire side of the nursery building was charred with a gaping hole above the entrance where the helicopter's rotor blades rested. Ukrainian officials said it was too early to determine what caused the crash. None immediately spoke of any attack by Russia. The aircraft was a French-made Super Puma helicopter. Ukraine's SBU State Security Service said it would consider possible causes, including a breach of flight rules, a technical malfunction, or intentional destruction. U.S. President Joe Biden expressed condolences to the families of those killed and said the United States would honor Interior Minister Monastirsky with continued commitment to preserving Ukraine's democracy. The Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has compared the West to Adolf Hitler in trying to achieve the final solution and accused the U.S. of leading a war against his country. He also said that Russia will achieve its objectives in Ukraine despite hybrid war waged by the West against Moscow. Russia's Foreign Affairs Minister has lashed out at the West's support for Ukraine in a series of fierce rhetorical blows during an hour-long news conference in Moscow. Speaking to reporters, Sergei Lavrov claimed the West was to blame for hostilities in Ukraine. What is taking place now in Ukraine is the result of many years of preparation by the United States and its allies to start a global hybrid war against the Russian Federation. In fact, nobody hides this. Just recently, Croatian President Milanovic said that this is NATO's war against Russia. It's a straightforward and honest statement. Lavrov also appeared to rule out peace talks, saying it was the West which had prevented Kiev from negotiating. The West decides on behalf of Ukraine. It was them who forbade Zelensky to reach an agreement with Russia at the end of March last year, when such an agreement was ready. So the West decides, and decides for Ukraine without Ukraine. Russian President Vladimir Putin, seen here at a World War II commemoration in St. Petersburg, has long blamed the West for provoking the war in Ukraine. But as the West steps up military aid for Kyiv, the Kremlin's rhetoric is becoming increasingly hostile. The Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Grossi, announced that an expert mission had begun work at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine. The plan is to maintain a permanent presence on IAEA experts at all Ukrainian nuclear power plants to provide vital nuclear safety assistance. The nuclear watchdog, the IAEA, has established a permanent mission at the Chernobyl nuclear site for the first time. The initiative is part of a new arrangement that will see experts deployed on a continuous basis to all Ukraine's power plants, in addition to Zaporizhia, where the UN organization has been present since September. IAEA chief Rafael Grossi said it was a special day. This is my sixth visit to your country since the beginning uh, of the war, which I believe in itself tests to the commitment of the IEA and my own personal commitment to assist in ensuring safety, security of the entire uh, nuclear uh, infrastructure uh, in uh, Ukraine. Chernobyl is the site of the worst civil nuclear accident in history, which took place in 1986. Russia briefly occupied the plant at the start of the invasion at the end of February. Consultations are underway on the establishment of a protection zone around the active Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in a move to prevent any possibility of a further nuclear accident during the current conflict.
The Bank of Japan maintained ultra-low interest rates, including a bond yield cap it was struggling to defend. Defying market expectations, it would phase out its stimulus program in the wake of rising inflationary pressure. The Bank of Japan did very little on Wednesday, and that was a shock. Analysts had expected the central bank to relent on its ultra-easy monetary policy. It's been the last among peers to resist raising rates. But policymakers refused to budge, keeping rates ultra-low. Governor Haruhiko Kuroda cited factors including the conflict in Ukraine and the legacy of the health crisis. Taking into account this situation for the economy and prices, it's important now to firmly support the economy and create an environment in which companies can raise wages. We at the Bank of Japan will continue monetary easing and aim to achieve our price stability target in a sustainable and stable manner in tandem with wage increases. The yen tumbled following the news. It dropped around 2.5% against the dollar. Some market watchers now think Kuroda will hold off on any big moves before his term ends in April. His last policy meeting will be held in March, after a decade at the helm. Over that time, he oversaw radical monetary stimulus, but failed in a bid to revive anemic consumer demand. Wednesday did see the BOJ lift its forecast for core consumer inflation over the current fiscal year to 3%. But the forecast for fiscal 2023 was left at 1.6%, indicating policymakers still expect price rises to cool off. We're going into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Stay with us. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now we have updates now from the forum in Davos. A rich Briton is amongst a group of millionaires in Davos pushing for governments to tax those, tax those like him more in order to bridge a wealth gap he wants is fragmenting the world. Tax us and tax us now. The plea of more than 200 millionaires in an open letter addressed to world leaders and other members of the global elite gathered in Davos. The current lack of action is gravely concerning. A meeting of the global elite in Davos to discuss cooperation in a fragmented world is pointless if you aren't challenging the root cause of division. Now is the time to tackle extreme wealth. Now is the time to tax the ultra-rich. The signatories include American actor Mark Ruffalo, Abigail and Tim Disney, a grandniece and nephew of the famed American producer, and Danish-Iranian entrepreneur Jafar Shalchi. While most come from the U.S. and the U.K., 13 countries are represented, including France. Still, French finance minister Bruno Le Maire saw the letter as an opportunity to brag about his country's tax system. They're welcome here. They'll have the right to one of the highest tax rates in any developed country. Let me remind you that if you're a millionaire in France, you have a marginal tax rate at 45%. So come to France. Believe me, we know how to tax you. But the so-called patriotic millionaires behind the letter would say that's not enough. In a report co-published with Oxfam and other groups, they note that a wealth tax ranging from 2 to 5 percent on the world's millionaires and billionaires would raise over $2.5 trillion annually, enough to lift over 2 billion people out of poverty and provide universal health care for all citizens of low- and middle-income countries. In France, such an additional tax would raise enough to plug the retirement deficit, making the government's controversial reform unnecessary. Also in Davos, the European Union responds to the United States Inflation Reduction Act with its own plans for a green package. The head of the European Commission put forth a plan to mobilize state aid and sovereignty funds to keep firms from moving to the U.S. The first day of official programming at the annual World Economic Forum in Davos started on Tuesday with bold declarations by Europe. The president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, said the EU was drafting a new law for its green industries and would back it up with state aid and a European sovereignty fund to keep firms from moving to the United States. We will put forward a new net zero industry act. This will follow the same model as our CHIPS Act. The new net zero industry act 
will identify clear goals for European clean tech by 2030. The head of the European Commission said the moves would be part of the EU's Green Deal industrial plan to make Europe the home of clean technology and industrial innovation on the road to net zero CO2 emissions by 2050. The announcement comes just months after the United States launched its own Inflation Reduction Act, or IRA, which was approved in August. The U.S. legislation includes a record 369 billion U.S. dollars in spending on climate and energy policies. The EU has since expressed concern about the design of the financial incentives in the package and that more European companies might move to the United States. In her speech, von der Leyen highlighted the EU's continuing commitment to free trade and refrained from criticizing the United States despite the strain the IRA has caused between the U.S. and the EU. She did not give any details about the European Sovereignty Fund, an idea she first raised in September which does not yet have the support of all EU governments, notably Germany. The United States has also not yet guaranteed it will give European companies the access they want to the IRA's financial incentives. Von der Leyen further stressed the need to work and trade with China on clean tech and push for a level playing field. A two-day parliamentary session in Pyongyang this week has come to a close with no appearance by Kim Jong-un, but a rather intriguing announcement regarding language preservation. North Korea's state-run Korean Central News Agency says the regime held the eighth session of the 14th Supreme People's Assembly for two days from Tuesday. Going against general speculation that leader Kim Jong-un would deliver a message on its weapons usage, Kim was not present at the event and there was no public message delivered from him. A senior official from the Unification Ministry says that Kim's absence doesn't seem unusual as he only attended nine out of the total 17 such meetings since he took power and because the items on the agenda at the latest meeting were general domestic issues. Despite Kim's absence, some notable decisions were made at the meeting, one of which was the unanimous passage of a bill aimed at protecting Pyongyang's standard language. The bill regulates the use of foreign languages in the regime, including dialects used in South Korea. Though the details of the bill haven't been revealed, an expert on North Korea says the adoption is aimed at tightening controls of overseas content and media coming into the regime. The passage sheds light on how much the regime is conscious of the public's use of language, especially teenagers. They seem to have concerns that the exposure to foreign content and foreign languages would weaken the North Korean people's solidarity and influence its governing system. Also approved at the session was North Korea's 2023 budget plan, which is up 1.7 percent compared to the previous year. The regime will raise spending on the economic sector by 1.2 percent, while its defense budget stays at the same as last year at 15.9 percent of the total. The KCNA says Premier Kim dae kun highlighted that the state budget should be implemented without fail to financially support the regime's defense and economic capabilities. Another development at the assembly was that Meng kyung il director of the Secretariat and Presidium member of the Central Committee of the Democratic Front for the Reunification of Korea, was elected vice chair of the SPA. Pundits are paying close attention to the latest change as Meng played a key role in improving inter-Korean relations during the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics, to which the North has sent athletes. A nine-person jury was selected to hear a trial that will determine whether Tesla CEO Elon Musk cheated investors with tweets in 2018 saying that he had lined up financing to take the electric automaker private. Inside a San Francisco federal court, a battle is playing out between Tesla investors and the company's CEO, Elon Musk, over tweets from Musk in 2018 that investors say were false and which cost them millions of dollars. A lawyer representing Tesla investors on Wednesday told a jury Musk lied when he tweeted on August 7, 2018, that funding was secured to take the company private. Millions of dollars were lost when his lies were exposed, the lawyer said during opening statements. But Musk's lawyer, Alex Spiro, defended his billionaire client, saying Musk was serious about taking Tesla private, telling the jury that Musk believed that financing was not an issue and was taking steps to make a deal happen. 
While Spyro admitted that the tweets contained technical inaccuracies, he insisted that Musk was concerned that some investors knew about his go-private plan and wanted to get the information out to the everyday shareholder. The case is a rare securities class action trial in which Musk is expected to take the stand this week. The lawsuit seeks unspecified damages for shareholders who bought or sold Tesla stocks in the days after Musk's 2018 tweets. Spyro said on Wednesday that Tesla's stock price jumped in response to Musk saying he was considering taking the company private and not his assertion about funding. Ultimately, a jury of nine will decide whether the tweets artificially inflated Tesla's share price, and if so, by how much. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Microsoft is set to lay off 10,000 employees. That comes as just under 5% of its global workforce. The company said in a securities filing that the move is to respond to economic uncertainties. High school students in Paris express solidarity with workers as the nationwide strikes kick off in France in protest against pension reforms. The police stood guard as more than a dozen of students gathered in front of a Helene Boucher High School. At least eight people were killed following avalanche in the city of Yinchi in the southwest region of Tibet. And the Chinese government has sent a team to oversee help in recovering bodies and the missing. Protesters and police clash in the streets of Lima during protests demanding the resignation of Peruvian President Dina Beluarte. Protesters threw objects at police, who in turn answered by firing tear gas. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And now we we'll leave you tonight with hundreds of pet owners in Spain taking their pets to church where they were blessed by priests marking St. Anthony's Day, the patron saint of animals. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and have a good night.